Good morning. So um, before we begin, as we normally do with the scriptures and the sermon, um, I, I feel called, I feel it incumbent upon me to begin with a word of prayer today uh, for our nation. So before we begin with our scriptures and our sermon, will you all please um, join me in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Glorious God, we need your grace right now. For years, our country has felt divided and heated and the temperature reached a horrific boiling point yesterday. We pray for former President Trump, for the family who lost a loved one in the crowd, and for our nation. For we're all watching prayerfully and we're watching anxiously, hoping against hope that good can come from evil, that light can shine forth from the dark, that love can emerge from hate. We come to you, O oh God, not with politics in mind, but with your kingdom in mind. You have entrusted us with the stewardship of this world, and we're fallen far short of your glory. You teach us, blessed are the peacemakers. You teach us, love your enemies. You teach us, pray for those who persecute you. You teach us, pursue peace with all people. You teach us, that it's not enough to refrain from murder, but we must not even be angry with our brothers and sisters. You teach us to turn the other cheek. You teach us that you're in charge. Justice and righteousness belong to you alone, O Lord. In these hot days of a scorching summer, we pray that our tempers may be cooled. Our kids are watching, seeing how we respond to this violence and this mayhem. We pray, O oh Lord, that this moment might be a turning point where we see that we have gone too far, too far with rhetoric and violence. May this moment be a turning point for grace, which brings out our better angels. Gracious God, you intend for us life, not death, peace, not violence, unity, not division, love, not hate. We pray that you would keep us focused ever on your kingdom, on doing your will and your will alone. And may our brothers and sisters uh, just across the state line in Pennsylvania feel your grace and mercy as they endure this crisis in their own community. We pray they know you are with them by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would be with us too as we do what we can to spread your good news in bad times. Help us to reach out to our neighbors. Help us to hug our loved ones closely. Help us to take care of our brothers and sisters and lift each other up, for we are all your children, O oh God. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you um, for indulging me for a moment as we switch up our normal means of doing things. Um, because our nation needs our prayers right now, our prayers and our prayerful actions in support of our neighbors. So let's now move on to today's scripture, um, which comes from Amos chapter 7, uh, verses 7 through 15. I'd invite you to pause now and read Amos 7, 7 to 15, and then come on back with me um, for today's sermon. Well, a friend said to me this week, um, he said, I got a weird idea for you. <laughs> and before he could even keep talking, I just said, I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> Why? Well, because I like weird, you know, weird ideas, weird music. Most of all, weird people. <laughs> so if I really like you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Probably means you're as weird as I am. <laughs> um, and that's why I love Amos. Now, Amos, he's, Amos is kind of a weird guy. Um, not much about Amos makes much sense. He was a southerner who worked in the north. Um, he was a farmer, but also a prophet. Whenever he was farming, he was talking about prophecy. And whenever he was prophesying, he was talking about farming. <laughs> so how'd this weird farmer get his own book in the Bible? Well, it's because his prophecies came true. Uh, it was around the year 850 B.C. Amos prophesied that Israel would soon fall. 
and he had specific reasoning in mind for that. He said they fall because the rich and the powerful had no regard for the average people. And sure enough, 30 years later, Israel fell when greed got the better of them. And Amos got his own book. <laughs> in the book of Amos, he has this series of three different visions. In the first vision, an invasion of locusts devours all the people's food and they perish. In the second vision, a great fire destroys the land and the water. Now, both visions um, essentially show a famine where the people in the land die um, because uh, in Amos's interpretation of their greed. They take and they take and they take uh, and they don't leave anything for anyone else ever again. It's a punishment that is fitting of the crime. And Amos knows it. And he rails against those who are stealing and storing up all the food every day. But at the same time, Amos begs and Amos pleads with God not to let it happen. And after both visions, um, God doesn't do it. Then comes the third vision, which we've just read, where Amos and God have a talk. Um, they're standing beside a wall. And God holds a, a plumb line to the wall showing Amos how crooked it is. Now, if you don't know what a plumb line is, Google it and you'll get a picture of Bob Vila. <laughs> you know, the famous DIY do-it-yourself guy um, holding up uh, or hammering in two nails with a string line in between them to make a straight line for building stuff. So the implication of the plumb line is clear. God um, has tested Israel the nation of Israel with the plumb line, and it's crooked as can be, unjust, unrighteous, corrupt, crooked. And unlike in the last two visions, here in the third vision, Amos doesn't push back. God, <clears throat> excuse me, God has judged the royal leaders, not all the people, but the leaders, as unrighteous, and Amos cannot defend them any longer. What they do that upset God so much? Well, you know, we talked about it briefly before. Instead of protecting the weak and the poor, they took advantage of them. They took their resources to store up more resources for themselves, more treasure for themselves, and God has had enough. And so has Amos. Now, Amos, uh, I can't remember if I mentioned this before or not, but, you know, Amos is, he's a prophet. Um, yeah, we did talk about that before, prophesying and farming. So Amos was a prophet, and his job was, a prophet's job, I think people get this sort of uh, mixed up sometimes. A prophet's job is either foretelling or forthtelling, and it might be both. So foretelling is what we normally think of with prophecy, and that's foretelling the future. Um, you know, seeing what's going to happen before it happens. That's actually not most of the work of a prophet. If you look at most of the work of the prophets in biblical times, um, they're in the business of forth-telling, which is telling the people a message from God. Prophets are messengers. Amos is a messenger. And Amos' message is clear. Stop exploiting people. He tells a story in the next chapter um, where the rich would buy off the courts in order to get a judgment that favored them and hurt the poor in Amos chapter 8. He told the religious and the political leaders that God despised that kind of behavior. Now, as you might imagine, Amos paid the price for speaking truth to power, just like Gandhi did, and just like Dietrich Bonhoeffer did, and just like Martin Luther King did. Uh, the son of the king's prophet killed Amos because they didn't want to hear about God's judgment. They didn't want to be told that they were crooked. For Amos, the prophet of God, the test of a nation is how it treats the least among them. Israel failed that test. The plumb line showed it. Now let me be very clear about this because I think it's easy to get it misconstrued. Amos is speaking to the leaders of the nation. He's speaking about the unrighteousness of the nation. I know in today's world, we often look to a scripture and we think, how does that impact me? How does it speak to me? 
how does it say something about my situation? What am I supposed to do about this? Amos is not speaking to individuals so much as he is speaking to the nation as a whole. So, would our nation stack up to the plumb line? I preached a sermon last week at uh, the closing service for Alderson Presbyterian Church. They've had a long and wonderful ministry, um, but for various reasons, um, they've decided that um, it is the end of their ministry and they're, um, they're joining with another church. So at that closing service, um, I shared a quote that was found at the top of their church history. And that quote comes from Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, he was a Frenchman who visited America in a quest to discover what makes this country tick in its early years. And so the quote from the Tocqueville, printed in the Alderson Presbyterian Church history, says, I sought the greatness of America in her harbors and her commerce, in her mines and her fertile fields, um, but it was not there. It was not, the Tocqueville says, until I entered her churches and found her pulpits aflame with righteousness that I understood the greatness of her power. The Tocqueville says, America is great because America is good. And if she ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Close quote. De Tocqueville says, in a much gentler, more diplomatic way, the same thing Amos was saying. The same thing God said with the plumb line, too. We are called to be good as a nation and as a community of people, especially to the least of those among us who are in need. And there is so much need around us. We started off this sermon and I'm talking about <laughs> being weird. And let me tell you, Amos is preaching a weird idea, not only for his world, but for ours today. Because the culture today teaches us to take care of ourselves at all costs above all else. That's not a kingdom value. God's kingdom values goodness. God's kingdom values compassion. God's kingdom values treating others the way you want to be treated. God's kingdom calls for righteousness, especially towards the nation's most vulnerable. Can we measure up? Amen.